Hey, hey, this is Chris with Produce Like a Boss, where we are arming you with the tools that you need to become a six-figure producer. Today, you're watching an episode of the Produce Like a Boss podcast, which you can also listen to on iTunes and Spotify. All right, let's jump in. That was one of the things that I I just felt like was a real through thread from that, was just realizing yeah. that- you have, it's a business. Like, it's a business. <laughs> and these people just need music. They need it quickly. And you have to be ready to get it to them. Do it like a, like a, like a boss. Like a, like a boss. Do it like a, like a, like a boss. Like a boss. All right, and welcome back, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Produce Like a Boss podcast. So happy to be joining you. I know we were away for a, a week or two because we were launching some exciting things I'm sure you already know about, but we're back in action this week. I'm, of course, joined by the wonderful and talented Chris Bradley. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. So happy to be back in action. And we have a special guest joining us on the show today, Mr. Tyler Summers. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing fabulous, and I'm so grateful to be with you guys. It's great to connect fellow Canadian here on the podcast. We're just trying to take over Produce Like a Boss. That's what we were talking about off air. <laughs> Michael yeah. and I, the Canadians on the team, are bringing in Tyler now. It's just uh, it's going to be a Canadian takeover. <laughs> it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very quiet takeover, which is exactly right. what Canadians do. Very Canadian. <laughs> Subtly <laughs> <Yes>. infiltrate. <laughs> be yeah. very polite oh about God. it. <laughs> it's a very quiet, polite takeover. Yes. <laughs> I'm not mad at it. <laughs> I love it. And so today we are talking about one of the hottest topics in the music industry right now, sync and licensing, and particularly how it relates to the world of advertising, which is Tyler's forte, you know, wheel of expertise. And I'm just so excited to get a chance to hear, you know, your perspective as an avatar. We were talking about, I'm a student of Produce Like a Boss as much as I am a team member. And I spent a lot of time in that sync and licensing world and, you know, reading a bit about y your story and stuff. It sounds like you came up against a lot of walls yourself. And I was certainly very much like, you know, you have that conversation with your mom, like, hey, we almost got on Grey's Anatomy. And they'd be like, you're on Grey's Anatomy? Like, no, we almost got on Grey's Anatomy. And that's like, that's pretty good. Like, people don't almost get on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> so I'm so excited to, to hear your story and your journey. And so, Chris, I'm going to throw it over to you as we kind of dive in and unpack. We've got some questions here and uh, let's just dig into this thing. Yeah. Well, first of all, Tyler, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today and chat all about this. Patrick is absolutely right. It's such a hot topic, you know, like who doesn't want to get their their music into film and TV and especially like ad spots. It's kind of like this coveted thing because we all know that the payouts can be really big and the recognition can be amazing and, and so can the clients. So let's just jump right in at the top. Like how did you break into producing for ads? Uh, well, it took a long time, <laughs> but uh, as it always does. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting world. Um, I came to it because I remember having a conversation with my uh, my then girlfriend at the time. We were broke and I could barely afford pizza for my band. And I was pursuing the artist thing. And I, I kind of looked at the world as kind of something that, that I've kind of done throughout my career. And I looked at the long game and I was kind of like, well, what is what is going to always be there? And I realized that brands are always going to want music and Coca-Cola is not going to run out of money. And I thought to myself, yeah. how can I figure out a way to get into that world? Little did I know that it would take about eight years to actually get into the world. But um, but yeah, it was it was absolutely 100 percent chasing those big those big sinks. And a lot of people don't know that there's also a lot of little micro syncs that go along with it too. So I uh, I started with it by getting into the sync world and then doing actual syncs, not advertising syncs, but syncs. And then all of a sudden I started getting what the ad people call briefs and I'm seeing numbers like $80,000, $100,000. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I'm playing a $300 wedding gig. What I could be making a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and it's so funny. It's like, I, I started seeing that and it's, it's, it was, it was so fascinating as a human being going through that and learning how to get into that world because it, it is so interesting about how it's so much different than being an artist. It's like, you can't take things personal and it's it's like you just have to show up and keep showing up and keep pitching and making people feel like making people making people's job easy showing up professionally and that was one of the things that i i just felt like was a real through thread from that was just realizing yeah that you have it's a business like, it's a business <laughs> and these people just need music they need it quickly and you have to be ready to get it to them and you can't take things personally and man did i take things personally for a very long time <laughs> 
Um, uh, so I, I kept saying, like, I just kept getting these, get, kept getting no, 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 no. And, and through, for the, for about eight years, I sat there and I just looked at what it was, you know, why are they saying no? What are the things that I'm doing that they like? What are the things that like, sometimes it would just be, it would be silent, 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 silence. And then I finally get an email and they, they would say, thank you. And then I realized, oh, thank you actually means that this is something that they're actually going to pitch. It's not like that was of their version of thank you. This is a cool track. They're not going to go to that length. They're just going to pitch it. Go, you know. So getting into it was me moving myself from an artist career of producing, producing singer songwriters where I was realizing that streaming was coming. CD sales were down. People mm -hmm. were taking touring revenues. And I was looking at all this this landscape and, and I was like, man, I just don't want that life. I don't want to pursue that life like I would love to to feel stable, like have a family, have a house, build a studio. And I took, I shifted from producing artists to how can I get into this game and how can I learn the tricks and the rules? And I just dove in and every time I got a no or every time I got a positive response, I would just put it in the checklist and be like, okay, mm -hmm. that's something to remember for next time. And okay, I'm not going to do that again. And uh, and I just learned a lot of lot of tricks and a lot of valuable lessons that eventually got me to a place where the floodgates opened and it was just commercial after commercial after commercial. And then it just hit. And I was like, oh, okay. Now I know. Now I know the rules. I'm not taking it personal if they say no. And and then it was just off to the races. Yeah. I love that pivot of mindset from, you know, like, hey, this is what I'm doing as an artist to like, hey, this is what I'm going to do as a business. Mm -hmm. And there's some new skill sets that I need to bring to this, including having a very thick skin, being very coachable, learnable, like, okay, learn that, going to do this, not going to do that again. Ooh, that worked good this time. Oh, that person ghosted me. That was a no, you know, and being able to collect all that and not just be the sensitive, wonderful, you know, heart-centered artist that we are, which it takes to sometimes create the art, but to be able to say, okay, I'm not wearing that hat right now. Um, is a really powerful mindset shift. And I just wanted to also kind of address something really cool, which is that 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 flip of the switch from, okay, B to C is not looking so good right now, right? Which means right. business to consumer, okay? We got streaming coming in. We've got, you know, CDs aren't really pushing as fast. And then being able to go, you know, I've got this talent. I've got this skill. And there's a saying in business and marketing, uh, right message, wrong audience, right? Mm -hmm. And you said, but it's not being valued in the way that I would like it to be valued. And I know that if I just take this same talent and skill over here, stack a few more skills on it to become like business minded and present it to this audience, right? Brands never run out of money. Brands aren't sitting there going like, hey, I'm going to give you a quarter of a cent for streaming this, right? So right. like, what do you think um, was like, how did you flip that switch? Because not every artist has that ability yeah. to go from sensitive, heart-centered, like I'm an artist, I do what I love, and you know, and and be able to turn on the business switch. What was it for you that allowed you to adapt that? One of the things that I definitely find interesting, as I know you do, Chris, too, is uh, not not only the music side of things, but the marketing side of things. And I'm very grateful that that's something that interests me because most artists just like they just like that's like right. so overwhelming to them. So what right. I did what was I, did. I took that that future looking concept of, I know that they're never going to run out of money. And I know that I have these skills. And not only that is I know a lot of fabulous, fabulous artists. And I love, I'm a connector, which I know you are too. And I love connecting people. And not only that, and I'm getting chills because I remember we had a conversation, you and I, where you were talking about produce like a boss and you were like, Oh, I'm getting chills where you're like, <laughs> I live for the emails that come to me that say that like I've changed their life or I've, I've like unlocked a secret. It's like, I looked at these artists and I said, you are struggling like we all are. And I, you have an amazing talent. You can write amazing songs. You can sing your butt off. Most of them honestly were singers. And I would then say, I would pitch to them. And I say, listen, I know that you're playing the $75 bar gig, but I think you have an amazing talent. And I think that you can, you can make some money in this industry. And I have the connections. Don't worry about it. Come over for a day. We'll write a song. I'll get your vocals down and then I'll finish it out. I'll produce it. And then you will do 50, 50, 50, 50 split and I'll get it out there. And I have made some of my dear friends, thousands and thousands and a couple of them, hundreds of thousands of dollars to put into their career just by coming over and hanging out. So I realized that instead of us start writing a heartfelt song for their record, which is going to get streamed for three cents, I said, well, why don't we use these rules that I've figured out or I'm actually like figuring out 
and yeah. trying things. So what would happen was, yes, I do believe there has to be a heart in it. And the artist would bring the heart and I would take that heart and then I would kind of mold it and say, just trust me, just trust yeah. me. And that's how I ended up kind of moving into the space of, it was just the heart needs to be there for sure, but you can get the heart. Right. But if you mix it with that business mindset and realize, hey, I know you want to talk about your ex-boyfriend that, that's just cheated on you, <laughs> but I'm like, you're never, you're never going to get an ad with that. So why don't we just take that same melody and talk about how much, you know, friendship means to you, you know, <laughs> right. let's keep it plutonic people, you know? Yeah. So it was one of those things where the heart, I, I have the heart in music too. And I do believe the ones that were most successful were the ones that were early on. In fact, it's not a matter of believing it's true because mm -hmm. I do believe that you have to have a piece of heart in there, even if the subconscious listener doesn't realize that because most mm -hmm. of the time they're just an ad agency sitting around making $400,000 a day in, in a, a year in a conference room hitting play. So I realized that you do have to have the heart. And some of our early ones where we had the most fun, those are the ones that to this day, 10 years later are still sinking because people can hear that heart. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's that purity of the artists that I was able to bring in and help, which is the whole reason that I was doing it really. And then we could combine the marketing and I could combine the connections and I could just put them in the advertising box just for a second. Right. And that's that seemed to be the recipe that really worked. So yeah. So it's it was a combination, right? It's mm -hmm. not like, oh, you, and I think artists feel that way so often too. Like I'm either like heart centered or I'm greedy. I'm either right. doing it for the man or I'm sticking it to the man. Like it's like, no, it's a, it's the perfect combination. Um, I like to say it like this. I always think of like, you know, there's either a flood, right? Which is chaotic or you have a beautiful river flowing down a bank. But in order for it to do so, you have to have the river banks, right? So sometimes those little boundaries that people like like you and I, Tyler, can, can find and go, okay, cool, let's fit it into this so that it can flow into a direction that can actually feed your artist career more than just doing anything you want, which is kind of the flood, right? Absolutely. I love that. It's a beautiful analogy. Totally. Patrick, yeah, I saw Patrick. When we were, you know, when I was writing a lot of stuff, especially early in the pandemic, that became sort of a channel that people started pursuing in sync writing. And it took a long, it took a minute to get your, you know, mind adjusted around like frameworks for sync licensing. Because I think particularly then once you start looking for hooks that will work in sync, it, we were able to sort of channel that same creativity, um, you know, as we would for a song that maybe was really personal, but it did take a lot of time. And as you started like more and more people started kind of writing in that world, you had to kind of be like, hey guys, like, here's the, here's the walls we're playing within. Like if we go this way, that's cool, but this song is going to die on the vine because we can't use it or pitch it. And people on our crew are getting publishing deals and stuff that work sort of these avenues for pitching these sync songs. But it took, you know, it, it wasn't an easy transition if you're so used to writing artist career and I'm in country. So we were really like, super specific lyrics right and and uh i'm sure you guys know from national time too like the national sort of writing stuff that specificity can can hurt you sometimes depending on you know yeah. the world you're working in sync so it's a big pivot you have to make so that's so interesting to sort of hear how you got to collaborate with artists to sort of bring the best of both worlds into it yeah i mean you're absolutely right it's it's it it is such an interesting lyrically especially it's such an interesting world because you're right the more specific you are the like I, i'm come from a concept of my writing concept was unless i'm writing directly for an ad agency that wants a specific thing it's like how do i do a blanket song that i just know is going to work hmm. and that's been the most success so you're right it's like if you're talking about having a six-pack driving down you know by the lake with your friends it's like, <laughs> it's like yeah, that's cool. But like you're writing to a picture, you know, and if that picture right. is not saying that it's like you're like odds of that song. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying if, there are so many, so many odd things that happen in the ad world, like like Apple is an example, like they've broken so many artists by specific things that they build the commercial around. And that's just not the way it works. Most of the time, if you want to win, I'd say 85 to 90 percent of the time, the song already exists. And it's in your hard drive and they're like, I need this by 3 p.m. And right. you have to deliver it, you know, and it has to be something that they can cut and chop up and do whatever. Most of the time they don't even use the lyrics. So it's like you just have to have it ready. And to me, the best way to go about it and the, that I felt I had the most success with was you're right. Not be specific. Take these artists and pull them out of that. And like, let's not talk about, you know, what you had for breakfast this morning. It's like. Right. Because, you know, if you're only going to get a Maxwell House coffee ad with that, you know, it's like you're right. not just don't talk about that. It's like mm -hmm. metaphorically, there's rules and you still have to be deep, but you can't be too deep. Like it's it's mm -hmm. it's really is it really is a fascinating world that 
when you really dive into it, it's just so much about the subconscious and the listener and what they're experiencing on the other end. Totally. You know what? I, it's so funny. This is like bringing flashbacks back to like my whole songwriting career. And I think of like all the phases that I went through. There was like, you know, the suck factor. I'm not really good to like, ooh, craft. I'm getting crafty. Ooh, okay. And then like all the ego that's involved with like wanting to, you know, express something in um, in a in a clever way, right? Like for example, like that's those specifics in Nashville are so, when they're really good, you get yeah. that like, oh, in the writer's <laughs> room from the other writers. And then everybody's just like having a songwriter love fest. But, you know, in the end of the day, sometimes like simplicity and not being clever, but just saying something the way that it is and being universal, um, that often is the thing that that will win something like this, right? And and I just found, you know, as I started to write more towards assignments and briefs and I was feeling like I was in a cage a little bit, I, at first it started with, okay, I'll do this because this will make money. But then it became like, no, I get why this works. I'm not excluding anyone. It's not too clever for anyone. This speaks to everyone. This melody is so catchy that like no matter what language you speak, you're going to love it. Like these universal themes, I eventually fell in love with writing music like that, where I went from this kind of purist artist trying to be something cool and clever and, you know, kind of serving myself to there's a reason this stuff works. And it's not just because some guy in a suit is trying to put you in a box, right? If we want to get into business, like there's data, there's evidence, there is like a market and they're looking at it going, we've got to use this to sell a product. How can we communicate in a way that like everyone gets this? And this is where we have to kind of take off that ego hat that I think that we have as an artist that wants to, and I don't mean to say ego in a negative way, we want to be praised for our talents, right? And so sometimes we don't realize like that simplicity is the best way and we're kind of wanting to overdo it, you know? And for me, just getting out of that all of a sudden, like I woke up and I was excited to write music that also happened to be profitable. Did that happen for you as well, Tyler, where you went from like, okay, I'm doing this for, and then you're like, no, this is awesome. Like I used to hate pop music and then I fell in love with writing pop music because of the simplicity. Absolutely love that. It is so true. I mean, the ego, the ego, obviously, in in every situation when it comes to art is is an interesting thing to navigate. And I definitely had that. And as you're saying that, I, I'm kind of going back and thinking about it. It's interesting that because you, you did you did say, well, the ego has to be there in a certain way. And you're absolutely right. And I'm yeah. thinking about my time. It's like, and I'm not sl I'm not slamming any of the people that I worked with, but I was always really good at managing egos. And, <laughs> yeah. and it's so funny. It's like the people that everybody hate are always are the ones that are my friends. I don't know why, but it's like I feel I just make them safe, you know, and it's like because I'm not combating them. I'm just trying to help. And, you know, as singers, ha singers have to have an ego. Like there's mm -hmm. a reason why Celine Dion slays, you know, like yeah. you, you may not want to have lunch with her, but she's a freaking great <laughs> singer. So it's like it's not to say who knows. I mean, I've never had lunch with, with her, but maybe she's great. I don't know. But um but yeah, it's like I was always really good at managing that artist ego and allowing that to flourish in the studio setting so that I could put it in a box. And I think that's the thing that you hit on totally. It's I think we feel safer as human beings when we have rules. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always thought that, you know, like I used to be a jazz musician and um, I say that because I was a lot better than I am now if I'm playing saxophone these days. <laughs> but uh when you, it's like, I remember somebody saying like, can you just improvise, just play? And the person was like, well, what are, what's the rules? Like, what song am I playing? What am I improvising on? And I thought to myself, I was like, interesting. Even in the jazz world where you're improvising, you still, you still need some kind of structure. And mm -hmm. the thing that I find really interesting about advertising is it is such a fascinating um, example of structure. And the way that I would approach some of these songs is I literally would already have it mapped out and we would just sit in the studio and be like, okay, well, let's just fill this first. Okay, what are we gonna do in this chorus? And literally, like you can you can have a map of a song for advertising, which is very different than pop music as Chris, I know you know. It's like you have this map and you're basically just filling it in. It's like you're coloring. It's like a coloring book, yeah. you know? And you have your two or three hooks and you throw them around and you've got your thing. And then you go, here you go. Here's your two minute song, you know? it's. It's so fun because the rules are so like, there's no questions. So when you take somebody that doesn't like rules and has a strong ego because they have an amazing career or a singer or whatever, if you make that singer feel safe and you just say, hey, listen, like, it's not that hard. Like, you'll say a line and are you, are you sure that line is what we should use? And I'm like, yes, it's done. <laughs> it's done. 
we're good. We, we're having a good life. That's the line. Good life. Okay, cool. Well, what's, what does that mean? Where's the depth there? I'm like, no, you're good. It's just like, have a good life. We'll fill in to make it be cool, but that's the hook, you know? And, and it just, it is what to me out of all the different things I've done in the music industry, it has the most rules. And it is one of those things where if you like to be in a box like that, you feel safe, you show up and it's almost, it is business. Like it's like, okay, let's just fill these boxes with this beautiful thing that you have, this gift that you have. And then we're going to present it and see what happens. And it really is just that simple. If, if, if you look at it from the perspective of I'm not approaching this to try to change the world, I'm approaching this to tick the boxes and make something that sounds cool and see what happens, you know, and yeah. not, and not and attach yourself to it. Right. And fulfill the needs of, of that, of that client, you know? Um, Absolutely. I know for me that it when I started doing work for higher stuff, like custom work, that was the most comfortable I ever felt because it was like, oh, I had this guidance, you know, of like, here's where we need you to go. Here's what we want you to deliver. Um, I tell you what, if you handed me a bank, a blank piece of paper and you told me to draw you like a bear or a tree, I would I, that just gives me anxiety just thinking about it. But if you like handed me a page <laughs> with like an outline and gave me some crowns and we're like, hey, could you color this in? I'd be like, I got you, you know, so totally. I, love the way you, yeah. I love the way you put that. So, OK. As simple as as it, it it sounds now, I'm sure that there it wasn't always this simple, right? There there had to be some challenges for you, especially in the beginning. What would you say was the the biggest challenge for you entering into the world of of producing for ads? Uh, I would say the biggest challenge was learning the word no meant something different than my ego thought it meant. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, it, it's one of those things, you know, everybody talks about it all the time and I, it's, you know, till they're blue in the face, you have to fail to succeed. And it's a little bit deeper than that. When the ad world, it's kind of one of those things where you have to, you have to not attach yourself, first of all, to tracks, like we just said, because there's mm -hmm. tracks that I spent a lot of time on that have made this much money. <laughs> there are times there are, there is one particular track that I did with a person, um, uh, a singer that we took, we did it in about three and a half hours. And it's probably made over the course of its life, I would guess like $120,000. So, and it, I literally last quarter, I still got another sink for it. So it just perpetually sinks. So you just never know. It's like, it's not a matter of how much time you put into it. It's a matter of, I always think about, I know I'm going off topic, but I think about Leonard Cohen and, and Bob Dylan as these two things that Malcolm Gladwell talked about, where Bob Dylan would just churn out songs, but Leonard Cohen was not finished with Hallelujah when he died. You know, it's like we yeah. all work differently. And I think when you're in a box, you can put something together and you can send it off and not attach to it. So I learned that I learned that the word no meant a lot of things. It meant that I needed to either look at the quality of what I was putting out. And some and there was actually people that I work with that I was like waiting for their email after they listened to it, you know, because my ego just needed to know whether they liked it or not. And when I got a yes, I'm like, oh my God, I'm, God, I'm yeah. safe. And, but it was like, it's not about that, you know? And I realized like, they don't mean me any harm when they say this track isn't good enough. And then the mm. one thing that I really realized that I took really hard is a quick little story at the very beginning of when I was starting to write ads, there was a K Jewelers campaign that was, that was coming out. And um, I, pitched a song um, from an artist, like from an artist perspective, because it was the, here's the funny thing. It's the only time in my entire career that I ever had a chance to write a love song for an advertisement. So it was a love song. So I'm like, that's my wheelhouse. I'm a singer songwriter. So I wrote this song and uh, it, it was up against somebody else who actually worked for the publishing company that I wrote it for. And that's a whole nother conversation because, you know, he, they're going to make more money off of him, obviously. But I didn't get it. And I was crushed. I was like, the world is out to get me. Like, I took it really hard. And I realized that, well, maybe I wasn't the right one for them, you know? And it's, it's oftentimes in this industry and in any type of sync world, because I've seen it happen over and over and over again, sometimes the best place to be is the last song they hear before the deadline. And I realized mm. that sometimes, and also as you know, Chris, I, you know, Patrick too, it's like they get this thing called demoitis where they'll hear mm -hmm. something that like a, like a basic track that um, uh, like a, just a licensing track, like a sync thing that's just random and they get attached to it, you know, and they don't, they don't really, they can't, you're trying to like chase that tail. And that is super frustrating because you can't copy it, you know, and they already have this thing. So, um, 
yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is you can't take things personally. And as soon as I started realizing, it's funny how this works. As soon as I started realizing that no's were a gift, no's mm -hmm. were information, then I could separate myself from it and step back and not be subjective about it, but be objective about it and go, let me look at this and not attach to it and go, what are they saying? No, don't take it personal. And sometimes what I would do, and this is really difficult to do, I know, because our ego and our fears, we don't want to know this answer. But sometimes if somebody says no, and you have a trusting relationship with them, you can actually email them back and say, can you tell me why you didn't like my track? <laughs> and that takes a lot of just separate yourself because right. if, you, if you want to know, you have to ask and you have to let them be honest because if they're like, hey, the intro was too long, that's some freaking valuable information. And they're like, your yeah. track right. started and I was bored. I'm like, wait a minute, what? It needs to be exciting right away? Like that's a gift, you know? Mm -hmm. And that information, I realized when it, I realized the no's weren't my enemies, the, no, the no's were my friend. That's when I really started to move up the ladder to really start picking out these tools that kind of got me over the top. No is your friend. Yeah. Fail, <laughs> failure is feedback, right? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Failure is so such feedback. And if you can get more feedback by asking the even more difficult question is why didn't I get it? They could just mm -hmm. say, hey, it, it wasn't for the you know, client didn't really feel like it was for them. Mm -hmm. Cool. You know? You know, it's really interesting of how you're, you're framing that. I heard this great quote one time that was the idea of like, you know, if you knew it took 99 no's to become successful, you would like hunt down no's like it was your day job and you would right. interact with them differently. And like you're saying, you know, as artists, I think it's so easy to like face rejection and also like such a this this craft is so like vulnerable and th th it's inherently like you're putting yourself out there. So rejection like hurts even more. But, you know, to sort of be a breakthrough a threshold, we're like, all right, I need 99 no's like and I got to get as much information because I know the yes is coming. And I think that's so hard for artists to, you know, people breaking into this world to get their head around. They're like, hey, you're going to have to like fail a ton. And you actually need that so you can inform how to yeah. succeed what they want. And that's just, you know, it's just so difficult for, for anything artistic. I think acting and dancing and, you know, that artistic field is just so uh, it's we're so empathetic as people <laughs> to go into this world, to just get like totally rejected in the harshest way of any other, yeah. you know, sort of like, uh, field. well, yeah, and, we it's, and it's, it's very much like a business world too. Like I know, um, Chris is really much into that too. We've had great talks like Adam Horowitz, I think it was, that said, if you want to be a good salesperson, get hung up on a thousand times, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it, if you treat the, this world like that, like if you want to be good in this world, just get told no. You know, and but you it's it's different because it's your music. You've been in love with it right. since you were a baby, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So much good stuff in there. I love it. So I'm curious, like out of all the stuff that you've done so much, like what's your favorite placement ever? Where it was a hell yes for you through the creation, like the compensation, just an all around win. What's your favorite placement? It's it was probably the first big one. So when I, my, my mountaintop was, I really wanted to hear um, my, like I wanted to hear one of my songs on television and I really wanted to like hear my voice on television. Cause I'm a saxophone player, you know? And I was like really insecure about my singing. So I was like, that'd be really cool, you know, to hear that. So I remember the funny thing is the company that I was working for, who I did a lot of my placements with, um, who I helped kind of build up their company as one of their writers. A lot of the times we would get placements and we would not know because we were writing things ahead of time that were just placement mm -hmm. friendly. And then all of a sudden I'd get, he's like, dude, I can't keep up. So I'm going to send you whatever comes, but they're just, I can't be in control of it. So I didn't even know that I got this placement. And I was um, sitting on my couch in Nashville, Tennessee with my cat Ping at the time who's since passed, poor little guy. But um, I'm sitting on the couch with Ping and I'm, I'm about to watch Jimmy Fallon. And this was probably like, this was the big first, like this is eight years in, and it was probably the, the first one in the, and one of the biggest ones I've ever had. So I'm sitting there about to watch Jimmy Fallon. It's like, you know, 10 o'clock at night or whatever. And all of a sudden this subway commercial comes on and it's like the $3 and 50 cent foot long or whatever. And I'm listening to it and I'm like, what the, wait a minute. No, wait, what? <laughs> and it was a quick, like 15, like 15 seconds. seconds. And then I heard myself go, da, 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 da. I'm like, that's me. And I was like, <laughs> what in the heck? And you just like, it was one of those moments where you're just like, what, what's like, I didn't even know it was coming, you know? Oh and it, gosh. and it just happened. And 
it's so funny. I learned so much off of that sync because I called my company and I'm like, dude, you didn't tell me we got a, so it ended up being a national subway ad for the whole um, like fourth quarter. Wow. And it ended up airing over 8,000 times. Whoa. And it was like, the, and the funny thing about it is, and you'd think that you'd be like, oh man, that was a big payday. This is what's so interesting about advertising is the front end, all I got for that was $750 after all the splits. And I, he's like, don't worry, don't worry. And then I learned all these really cool things about advertising where if your song plays at a certain time of day, you get a certain amount of money. And if it plays during prime time, it's like how many people are watching it? So I learned a lot. And uh, then I got my first royalty statement. <laughs> And that ah. was that was twelve thousand dollars. So it was yeah. like one of those. Yeah, it was one of those things where you're like, okay, cool. I mean, it, yeah. Sometimes it's just such an interesting world because sometimes the front end is a hundred thousand dollars and they buy you out. Sometimes the back, right. you know, it's it's so many different rules and it just, yeah. So that had to be probably probably the coolest one. You never forget your first. That's <laughs> you know what's hilarious about that story is like it's almost simulationy uh, in the sense of like you know as artists you always want to hear your song on the radio but you don't want to know it's coming like I've had songs play on the radio right. like one time and then I'll go in the car and I'll hear it's like yeah you want to catch it in the wild that's like Ooh, I love that radio. I love that yeah. <laughs> and when that happens that. like that that happened to me you know for the first time like I was just driving and it came on and you're like this is this is what everyone said it was going to be like. It's as amazing as they thought. So for you, like your first huge sync to actually be like, man, I wonder if I'm ever going to get sync placements and then it's a subway commercial. <laughs> like it's almost like too fairy tale. That's such an incredible experience for that first. Yeah, video. I love that. Like to hear it in the wild. I'm going to need to borrow that one. <laughs> <laughs> All yours. You take that for one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that one. Um, so, you know, I think just based on what I've seen in our community, you know, I've seen this kind of question floating around a lot where artists are very particular about what they want and what they want to attach their name to. And for good reason, you know, we put in a lot of work to develop our brands and have our, our own unique messaging that comes with that. So there's not always going to be synergy, right, between a lot of these different, you know, companies that you could potentially be partnering with by writing their song. So I'm curious, like, how does a musician break into the ad world if they don't want to attach their artist name to other brands? You know what? It's 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 something that I dealt with on a regular basis, um, and I and I think that's a very fair thing to to bring up. I had a lot of people that built their careers that were really great artists that wanted to break into the scene, but they're like, "Hey, man, like I don't really want to be. I don't drink, so it's like I don't really want to be on a like a Budweiser commercial." And that's very yeah. fair, and I totally get that. Um, and I think the solution, oftentimes the difficult things lead to a solution that actually makes it even better. And what can happen with that and what I actually experienced was what you're able to do is you're able to step back and look at what your strengths are and you pick out what those things are. And then what you do with those strengths is you say, well, how can I build a brand around that strength? So my particular thing was I was good at singer songwriter. I was play saxophones and horns. So I had like an R&B throwback thing going on that I could do. I can play piano so I could do like a classical kind of piano thing. Um, and then the other thing I did a lot was like orchestral kind of popish stuff. So what I did was I built four brands that I could pitch. It's just me. And the way that I would do that was I would come up with a concept of what the sound was going to be. I would come up with the name of the band. I would start, um, I would come up with the color scheme. I'd come up with the logo. I'd start building the social media around it. And what I would do and what my advice to anybody that wants to do this is, say you're, say you're an artist and you have, you know, 1,000, 2,000 fans. And you're like, you don't want, you don't want to pitch this stuff to them. Because it's not, if you're really doing it by the rules that I believe you need to do it by, you might land something as an artist. That's, again, there's no hard and fast rules about that. But if you really want to land in this business, all, almost I could pretty much guarantee that your fans are not going to want to listen to what you're going to put out because it's not going to be a thing that is going to be like re-listenable from the soul as far as like the interesting thing about ad music is you can't make it too interesting, but you have to make it interesting because you can't take away from the picture, and the, but it still has to get, <laughs> they still have to love it on the first listen. And oftentimes when you listen to an ad piece away from the picture, it's, it's just like, oh, I would never really listen to this because it's kind right. of boring. So what you would do is you would take your superpower and this is what I did is I would take those four superpowers that I felt that I had and I would either 
collaborate with like a great R&B singer or I would collaborate with the singer songwriters. And here's the genius is you make a band name and it doesn't need to be, it could just be you, that's fine. But what I did was I would name, take a band name under a singer songwriter umbrella and I'd have like five different singer songwriters that would be under this umbrella. So I'd build a band and I'd get like a following or I'd reach out to people and I'd have the social media, but I could put it under umbra an umbrella of a singer songwriter sound with guest artists. Mm -hmm. So I was the producer and then I would have collaborations with people outside of myself and put it under this umbrella. So basically what you're doing is you're building an umbrella of a, a brand that you can then take the sound and put it inside of. So I have a I have a orchestral kind of classical thing that I have called Imaginary Owl. So anything that I do with Imaginary Owl is an instrumental thing, an instrumental pop thing. But also like I'll have friends come over and we'll do like a black keysy kind of sound, but mixed with my sound to make it Imaginary Owl, but they're now in on it. So what you're doing is you're combining superpowers and putting it under an umbrella. So my advice to an artist would be really take some time, look in the mirror and go, what am I the best at? What am mm. I better than any any of the anything that I can do? What would I what is resonating the most with people in my artist career? And the first thing I would do is build an umbrella around that. And the second thing I would do is find other people that are really good at things that you're not really good at. So you can be an amazing singer, but you don't have any clue how to build tracks or beats. Go find somebody that's really freaking good at building beats. And then what you're going to do is the more superpowers that combine, it's like Captain Planet, Earth, Wind, whatever, <laughs> this, whatever, you know, the more you can have, like, it's just basically you're exponentially growing your ability to land these things because you're, you're combining superpowers. So... It's literally just building an umbrella that can encompass a sound. And it's really deciding the sound, coming up with the name, building the vibe, build a website. My favorite, my favorite trick that I learned early on, I'm like, man, I see all these like bands, but they're not even really bands. Like I watched this guy just slay it with like he had a black keys band, singer songwriter band. He's actually the guy that ended up getting that K Jewelers commercial I was talking about. But like, and he had like an electronic band and it was all under this umbrella. And he'd have these websites that would look super cool and all these things. But like, man, like, how do they believe that he's a band? And he did this trick where you'd go to his website and you'd hit tour dates because you're like, this guy's not even touring. And it would always say, currently in the studio making a new record. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> genius. <laughs> <laughs> like, so an ad agency is going to go there and go like, that's what they want to do. And I think that's the important thing is you have to make it current. You have to make it cool. Think about the guy that's sitting in the office that, you know, that wears a suit and tie. He wants to be attached to cool. He wants to be attached yeah. to an energy. So you have to create that energy and you can create that energy under an umbrella. You don't even need to use your face. That happens all the time. It's just a vibe, yeah. a look, you know, go to Adobe Express or Canva and create a vibe. You know, there's so many opportunities to do that there. And what they want to do is all they want to do is love your track go to your website and see that you're doing things. And then all of a sudden they're attaching to your vibe. And that's the other thing too, is on the flip side, if you really want to do this as an artist, the thing that is really fascinating is in briefs, always, always, always. And I know you guys know this. It says uh, the budget is flexible depending on the artist. Mm -hmm. And that means that like I, I had a, I had a really fascinating thing happen where I was working with a guy up in New York and he called me and he said, Hey, I got this Glade commercial. They wanted Rihanna, but she wanted half a million dollars. And all that they, all, all that Rihanna need to do was, and I'm feeling good. You know, that Nina Simone thing. Right. And that's all he needed. And they were like, they don't, she wants half, half a million dollars. And he was in a, and here's another thing is he was in a rush. He needed it right away. And he's like, Tyler, I need help. And sure enough, I had a singer that could knock it out and she came in and did it and ended up doing three Glade commercials back to back to back and made over $100,000. <laughs> and it's like, that's the thing is you, you realize that whatever it is that you're doing, like you could sound like the Rolling Stones. And when Rolling Stones say, I want $1.5 million for satisfaction. And you go, well, hang on a second. I got a song that sounds like satisfaction. I'll give it to mm -hmm. you for 50 grand. It's like, you just have to look at what's working and what the sound is and what's current. And uh, I know I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but I think this is a really valuable piece of information. If, as you're building your sound, as you're building your brand and your umbrella, pop music is typically about 12 to 16 months ahead of advertising music. 
So, and the way that I know that is because it's worked for me over and over and over. My most successful song that I've ever had that's made over $100,000 and it's still sinking was a copy of Megan Trainer. Mm. Um, it was like, it's exactly Megan Trainer. My singer sounds like Megan Trainer. The track sounds like Megan Trainer. It's throwback soul. And Megan hit with that big that big track, and I'm blanking mm. on the name of it now. All, about, all, about, that all, about, all about that bass. All about that bass. We were like, let's make an all about that bass. And we did, and sure enough, eight to 10 months later, it was just like, bam, bam, bam. And that song, actually, my, my, my guy that pitches it said, if there was a billboard for number one, like song of the year for advertising, he said this would be in the running because wow. it just was so popular. And it was just literally us chasing pop music 12 months ahead. Right. Wow. That's really good insight to have, right? Like as you're watching the charts, know that it is about 10 to 12 months ahead so all yep. you have to do is reverse engineer, right? And go, okay, like, what can we look at 10 to 12 months ago? That's so That's incredible. Let me ask you this, Tyler, because I've heard, you know, I've been in the sync world a little bit and not so much actively getting placements, but I've done some courses and stuff. And I've sort of spoken to a lot of people. And Chris obviously is, a, you know, a great wealth of knowledge in that world too. How do you feel about when targeting ads, um, doing like market research? So if we're sort of saying that like, you know, maybe pop charts are 12 months ahead of what ads are going to do. You know, would that mean that maybe it's not the best idea to use market research of like old BMW commercials and like kind of the commercials of this era in terms of like building sound alikes, building your, you know, your mood board, so to speak? Where do you sort of stand on the market research idea? Love that. It's a great question. And yeah, I did a lot of that. Um, that's great. I, I think that the way that I've quote unquote won a lot is... Um, I just kind of use my gut as far as what I think is going to go to the masses. So it's like, you can go look at the charts and in the speaking specifically pop, but I'll talk about adver advertising market research in a sec second. But if you're looking at pop charts, you can listen to a track in your gut and you can go, you know, I don't see target aligning with that. You know, I don't mm. see whatever. It's like, you're not going to get some, you know, rap thing that has all the cuss. Like, it's just not something, yes, that'll happen, but it's like, the cuss like the swearing and the whatever the all that's right. like it's just going to turn ads off they don't want to attach to that right mm -hmm. um i think what you start what you start seeing is instead of specifically narrowing in on like the current bmw commercial or the current budweiser stuff yes i do get briefs that say these are the these are the ones that have won with this particular agency in the past so just take note of these but we need something current so what i would do is i would take a temperature of the market. And I also, my favorite, I'm a huge cryptocurrency nut and I love cryptocurrency <laughs> because it's not only finance, but it's also social and social media and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm a nerd about that. I love watching trends. So what I would do also, ooh, I'm getting chills just thinking about because it's so fun. <laughs> what that particular, all about that bass track spoke to me and it, and this was right at the beginning of the feminist kind of movement and the empowerment of women. And so what I saw and I saw coming was in, in the social settings, uh, I went to my singer and I was like, hey, we need to write an empowering song for women. And that was exactly what happened. It started going into the feminine movement and women were starting to feel more empowered. And all of a sudden now, for like two and a half years, you were seeing all these companies empowering women. You know, Target had like five or six huge campaigns about empowering women. And we wrote with the concept of, what would this brand want to attach themselves to socially that's also happening in the charts? Mm -hmm. So you're like not mm -hmm. only watching what musically is happening, but you're also looking at the world. So I get briefs now that say a lot about LGBTQ, you know, like mm -hmm. we'd love to have this particular. I got one today for a TV show where it was these two, um, these two women are going to kiss in this romantic moment. We need this dreamlike track and we would love it if it was, you know, a certain type of artist, you know, so it's like, I know I'm always going to get that wrong, but LGBTQ, all the different things. But that's a very popular and very like social thing that's happening right now. And you start to see that reflected in not only sync, but you mm. see it reflected in music. So I think to me, it's about zooming out. It's not about like, well, what did BMW use for the last campaign? It's like zoom out and take a temperature of what the social aspect is happening and try to it's like crypto. It's like trying to guess what the next big thing's going to be. It's like, right. take the temperature, look at what's coming. And also, it's really important to hear music and pop music that you would listen to that's current 
And like I said, to go back to the beginning, it's like, would it work for Target? Would it right. work for this? Like, because there has to be an element of uh, safety and vanilla in ad music, but there has to be like a lemon swirl. You know, you, right. you just have to have the safety, but you got the lemon swirl. And it's like, what's the lemon swirl look like? And most of the time, pop music is like a big lemon swirl. And all right. you're doing is you're making a little lemon swirl. So it's like, how do you take the temperature socially? And yeah. then what is the... Um, uh, what is just what is the vibe of what would work now in pop music? And I, as soon as I heard that all about that bass, I was like, oh my god, I hear this on a Target commercial all the time. And I think she landed her next two singles were were immediately commercials, and that just propelled that whole female movement, you know? Right. And I'll take this as an example. I landed some. Um, I landed two commercials, one with Google and one with Budweiser, um, during COVID. And you know what that was was. I had a, I had another song. It didn't land anything, but I have a feeling it was going to. But it was called "There for You," and I had I had these other two land because it was you know it was um, frontline workers. It was very emotional. It was people clapping. You know, in Canada, everybody would ring the bells and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it was all like, getting chills. But it's like I I had these classical pieces that I would write to picture, and I, I got the temperature of the land of there is such a somber element of what's happening right now, and if you can capture that ahead of time and see it coming, then you're going to have a better chance. And my mentor who taught me a lot about this was very adamant about that. He's like, and he was always right. He said, Tyler, and he would do it with movies too. There was one point where you remember, you know how Batman went from like a cartoon to like the darkest thing you see, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, he was like, Tyler, I think everything's going to go darker. It's going to get like more aggressive. And he said that in the ad world, cause he had a Sears commercial he landed that was like, Oh, it's the good life. You know, like this happy world. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's like, that was when all the whistles like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, Very Jason Marazzi. Yes, exactly. Ukulele whistle. Ukulele whistle. And I have landed a bunch of those. It's funny, but he was like, "You got to stop doing those, man, because they're not they're they're gonna go away." And sure enough, they did. And then it became feeling right. empowerment, and then it became like mm, 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 you know this aggressive kind of yeah. energy. And it's literally just about taking the temperature of the world, basically. That I remember when every brief that came across my desk for two or three years was female empowerment. Yes. I was yes. like, here we go. Here we go. That That's so smart. Like, yeah, taking a temperature of what's going on socially as well as maybe like, you know, it's like kind of like when you hear of an artist that's like, oh, you know, I want to get a cut with like Carrie Underwood and they write Carrie Underwood songs that like were cut like 10 years ago. It's like, no, 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 you got to go right. where she's going. She doesn't want like what she did last time. But I think you can always like find that common denominator of a brand from a feeling aspect, right? Where they may have used Led Zeppelin, you know, been a long time since I rock and roll. And then they may have used Rihanna on another, but it's like find that common denominator of like, what's the feeling of like coolness or, you know, married with the social cause and see if you can kind of hop on that, right? Absolutely. So, and it's, it's well, like you wouldn't want to listen, like Taylor Swift's not going to sing Tim McGraw. You know, it's right, like right. That, that song's like I hear it now and I'm like, wow, that's not even close to where she is. You know, Well, and it's funny because she is genre hopped so much and done so mm -hmm. many different things. But there is a Taylorism in everything that she's done that like Absolutely. it's still there. Like a brands maintain that like foot in like it's that one foot in as they explore, you know, other things around them. Um so, OK, so I'm I'm curious now because I'm thinking of this a la bad that base, bad that base. I can't get that out of my head. So, like, what would you say is the the difference between like the production when you go to create a track? Like like if you were making an artist track for her as opposed to what you did for the ads, like what are the differences in structure and stuff like that? Yeah, it's very it's very different. And I think people people that's the biggest mistake people make is they as you like to always say, Chris, and I love this is reverse engineer things and my my real big wins have always come from okay put it up to a picture and does it work first mm. and then two i've done enough now where i've i've talked to enough ad agency people that i those are the people that come to you and tell you tell that they want your track to be a little bit more red you know it's like <laughs> they don't they don't have that musical and a lot of people would take that personally and be like how dare you not know music <laughs> But I don't take it personally. And because, and going back to your point earlier about you always love working with people that put you like, here's what I want. Like I literally just did a, I did a, a, a two, two campaign, two song campaign for um, uh, a finance company that finances, does stuff in uh, crowd, crowd street. I should know. Cause I've heard the, I've heard the overdub talk in my head. <laughs> like I was dreaming of the overdub cause it was just always playing. Uh, and the person at the agency I work with, the creative director, 
He's a great guy, and I've done a bunch of stuff with him. And this particular one, we were chasing something that he really was hearing that I was was trying to find. And uh, sometimes it just works. Like we did one campaign where he's like, yep, these are great. And then sometimes it's like, no, I'm, something's, something's there. So he's trying to communicate to me. He's trying to communicate to me like stuff that he doesn't understand. So I'll play a chord and I'll be like, do you want it to be kind of sad? Do you want it to be happy? Do you like this movement? Because, you know, as the more you do music, the more you realize certain movements create certain emotions. It's like, that's a good exercise. It's like happy. What do you do? Right. You know, sad. What do you do? Thoughtful. You know, it's a good exercise to do that. And so when you're in those situations with those people, you realize that they're not musically inclined and they either cover up, cover up for it with their ego by stepping back and being like, I know music and your track sucks. Or they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't know how to explain it. And this particular guy who had worked with other people in the past said, I'm so sorry, Tyler. I don't like, I'm just giving you all the information that I'm capable of and I'm doing my best. And I had to stop him. And I said, I said, man, I, any information that you give me is valuable. I don't take any offense to anything. Like if you don't like a track, you don't like a track. Like I'm not attached to it. I'm trying to capture your vision. So when you reverse engineer from people that really aren't in the music industry, and sometimes they were in the music industry, they didn't quite make it and they've got a chip on their shoulder. And it's like, it's just about making their ego feel safe and making them feel like, Hey, it's, this is, you're cool. If you don't, if you don't like it, let's go in a different direction. So if you reverse engineer from, I love reverse engineering from this place of, I had this vision in my head of three men in suits that make half a million dollars a year in a white office with a television that are going like, <laughs> okay, we got to figure this thing out for Target. And what I would do is reverse engineer to a place where I'd even do it in a place, like even go as far as to say, they don't even have a sound system. It's literally on a laptop speaker. <laughs> and they're like, okay, I got this track from this guy named whatever the band is, you know, and it, it's my band, whatever. And then it's like, we checked them out. They look pretty cool. Let's listen to it. And on the laptop speaker in this multi-million dollar office, they hit play. And I think to myself, first of all, how do I get their subconscious to feel safe? How do I make sure that they play it twice? And how do I make sure it doesn't overwhelm them? So if you go mm. from those perspectives, when you look at how you're building a track, all about that bass is great, but it's more about repeat listens. It's more about there's interesting things to find in it. So what I would do is I would even, again, putting myself in these rule boxes, there's such clear rules. It's like, you can't have an intro that's too long because they'll get bored. Lyrically, it can't go too deep because they're, it's gonna be cheesy, but it has to go deep enough where they're interested. There can't be eight hooks. Uh, I'd stick to like two or three. But what you do is you take the two or three hooks and then you start stacking them on each other. So that's a little mm -hmm. trick because I'd introduce a hook. Then I'd play the same hook. So their subconscious is like, oh, I know that hook. But then I'd introduce a new one. So it's about make it really is about making the listener excited about it, but not overwhelmed and mm -hmm. doing little subconscious hacks to make them feel connected to it. And there's ways to do that. And to me, it was always as much organic element as you can put into it because we respond to organic stuff. And then also, if there's a singer there's or if there's any type of vocal, anything like that, you have to make it so that it feels and not in their face. And the way you do that a lot is with vocalese where you're just doing, you know, just not words, but just melodies with singers. Mm -hmm. And or like almost every track that has landed for me and it's and I, I've I could talk about this verbatim. It's like, to me, when, when somebody is not a musician and they're not listening from a musician's perspective and judging the chord changes or the lyrics or whatever, it's very tribal. And I believe that there really are four elements in advertising. I call them the four C's. But one of the things is, is like carnal like drumming and stuff like that. Like, doom, 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 doom. like I've, how many Nike commercials are LeBron James like right. shooting a basketball? Yeah. Doom, 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 doom. You know, that's one of the C's I call carnal. Yeah. But it's like, but also the thing that wins all the time is gang vocals. When you have gang vocals in your track, if you can, and I can stuff them in R&B, I can stuff them in pop, <laughs> I can stuff them in singer songwriter, I can stuff them everywhere. Because what it's doing is it's telling the listener that whatever is happening is safe and it's cool and it's awful. a party the whole tribe <laughs> is on board 
Right. Yeah. So right. if you can stuff gang vocals in, and I mean stuff, but if you can put them in there somewhere and there, you can always find spaces for that. That to me is also a way. So I reverse engineer it, literally thinking about what those three people in that office are going to want to hit play again, feel safe subconsciously and not get overwhelmed. And that's how you build your tracks. Wow. Oh my God, I love that. Uh, that didn't go where I was expecting it to go, which is awesome because I was like, oh my gosh, like make them feel safe. Like that, that's, that's so, that's such a unique way to put that. So it sounds like as you've, you've been going through kind of as we've been talking, like multiple genres, you've referenced, I've done rock, I've done R&B, like I'm stuffing that as singer songwriter. Like, is there any one genre that is best suited for ads or is it really a multi-genre space? To me, the best genre that's suited for ads is whatever genre you're the best at. Mm. So, Ooh, yeah, it's <laughs> put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I can show you examples of all these different genres and the rules are exactly the same. And all you're doing is you're just you're just putting them. You're just putting those rules and you're putting them in a box. So whatever, whatever it is that y is your superpower, like we talked about earlier, whatever combination of superpowers that you have, you can literally reverse engineer from those people in that office to whatever your superpower is and you can literally take off and you just go you go with the rules you go with what you're good at you combine and then you just fill you color in the boxes and as long as you're always checking in and from a perspective of what is this going to be received like how is this going to be received and if you go by the three rules like i said of making them feel safe uh, making it interesting but not overwhelming them then as long as you're checking in on that, genre has nothing to do with it. And literally, as long as you're not stepping into a genre that you're not comfortable in, but genre has nothing to do with it. And I do also think that t taking the temperature of advertising to, to preface by saying genre has nothing to do with it. You could make a, you could make a song that sounds like death metal with these rules, but your chances of getting an ad are probably not great. So I would say that, yes, you could make you could make a track that's in these rules in all these different genres, but taking a temperature of what genres are working. And again, that goes back to what is happening in pop music now and what mm -hmm. genres do you feel a what, what brands are going to resonate with what's on the radio now? And if that genre fits you or if you feel like, yeah, Target, we get behind that Walmart to get behind that McDonald's to get behind that. And. If you can see see that genre and then also see, okay, cool, well, I can see this coming later and I'm going to put these two rules, those that mix is going to be the thing that's probably going to win the most. So you just have to take, again, the temperature of what genres are working. And pop music is right there. You have it right in, at your fingertips. And you also know that there are certain genres that not slaying anybody, but you know, I'm not a big death metal fan. And I don't think that McDonald's wants to do a death metal commercial. And I'm not saying that death metal's bad. There's a huge following for that, but I just don't think it resonates with certain brands. I could be wrong, well, but maybe 24 it's months from now. from now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, depending on the way the world works, <laughs> death metal might be where we're headed. <laughs> Would you say that overall, though, like, I mean, speaking to that, like, they're, they're really, it sounds like love songs, meh, not, or kind of a no-go, um, which is actually kind of, you would, you would think being that upbeat is kind of a common denominator. Um, I was surprised to learn that love songs are, they're often not looking for that, right? Because it's not, I guess it's not as universal, right? It's like, it can be like, I love life. I love my friends. I love it, but not like a like romantic love rather. So Death metal's a no-no. Love songs are a no-no. Would you say that positive and upbeat and up-tempo is a common uh, denominator among successful ad music? Yeah, my thoughts on that are it, anything can be successful for sure. Like my friend saying, our land is your land for a Budweiser commercial that landed on the <laughs> Super Bowl. So it's like you never know, right? It's So it's the way that I like to look at it is, like I said, these, these umbrellas that I always write in um, is... It either has to fall under the umbrella of it being cool, um, as in like slick, you know, mm -hmm. um, carnal, as in the tribal stuff we talked about, um, connection. So like that's your togetherness, your friends, um, you know, like your like I got you, you're fine, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and then um, catchy, catchy, so catchy, catchy to me is. is the current stuff. 
So it's those things that I really think that whatever genre can fit into that with what's pop at the time is going to work. However, you're absolutely correct. The thing that has always worked for me is the concept of how, how do you get your song to sync with the picture so that the person that's listening wants to move to go buy the product. Mm. Mm. And the way that that functions for me always is, is you have to have a beat that's driving if you're doing like a pop thing. Like, again, like I said, like I did a piano solo thing for a Google ad and it was just piano. There's an emotional side. That's the connection thing. Connection also can have, singer songwriter can have four on the floor, but so I'm not discounting. Like if you're a beautifully trained classical pianist, absolutely you can do this. So I'm not, I don't want to separate that out. But you're absolutely right. I think if you're going to win the most, you're going to have some kind of driving beat. And the subconscious concept of that is get the person to go to the store. Get the right. person I to go to I just think of the energy stores. that's moving. It's like what is yep. happening when you're listening to the music? Like if it's upbeat and it has like a good beat to it, it's going to make you like your body want to move. And I would think that that would be what a brand would want so that you can move to get up to make it over to the store to pull out your wallet and, you know. It's yeah, that energy, I, I, right? It's like if it's drag ass energy, like that, like who wants that? You know, while that might be appropriate for a specific scene in like a movie or a TV show, if it's mm. meant to paint that picture, advertising is um, it's it's sales, right? And and sales is usually coupled with up upbeat, good feeling, you know, energy, emotion, vibe, and right. and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm just thinking about some titles that have been most successful for me. Like one of the songs that was the most successful is that I've been talking about. It's called Here I Come. Another song that I've had is called Moving On. You know, it's like, like, do your own thing. It's like, it's, these are the titles that you have for the pop thing. And then it's funny, the most successful singer songwriter I had, I had, I had landed in a few things like a Starbucks commercial and stuff like that of like a family, like Christmas time, you know, right. having coffee and stuff. That song's called Home and that's not yeah. movement, that's safety. So yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of subconscious concepts too about like, you can either make them feel safe and together and stuff like that. Or I got you. Another one I have is like, we're all in this together or like with you tonight. You know, it's like those safety things. And then a coupled with if you're doing a pop song, they want you to move. They want you to buy the product. Right. That's the whole point. Oh, and such a good point. What's interesting too, what you're kind of talking about, Tyler. And, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made when I was first trying to dive into sync was to try and do things I was not very good at, but seemed like the thing to do. And, you know, as you talk about like monitoring temperature, like mid pandemic, every commercial that was out there was like, we're here for you. And it was like sombery, like rise from the ashes sort of vibe. And I think like ultimately I kind of pivoted a bit, but I think I would have found more success earlier if I, you know, like I'm better at sort of singer songwriter, like home style songs. Like I can knock out like all day long, but I was trying to sort of get like the green light goes snappity pop stuff that, you know, all the people that we were writing with weren't very good at so the idea that you're kind of mentioning you know for artists that are trying to break in maybe start with the thing you're really good at and you know in your position where you're sort of covering the gambit people that are coming in you know staying in your lane is really valuable like if you can knock out a home song like it's your life dependent on like that's amazing and then that doesn't mean you can't that doesn't exclude stuff later to go into these other worlds but i think trying to spread yourself so thin and be like well i'll just cover all this stuff, it's like, well, if you can't do a Megan Trainer kind of track, figure out what you can do. And maybe that doesn't mean you can get every brief that's going to come your way. But the ones that do come your way, you can nail. And then you can sort of, you know, grow as, as you want. Because I think that a lot of artists trying to get into sync try to be everything to everyone instantly. And that can sometimes, um, you know, lead to no results because they just, they kind of do everything mediocre. And, and that can be really, you know, really counterproductive to what their goals are. That's a great point. Absolutely. And I would say, I would further that point by saying that Think about who you're competing with. You're competing with other people that are amazing at what they do. Right. So it's like, right. why don't, why? I remember this when I, I was living in New York City and I was, you know, I just finished my jazz degree and I was living in New York City studying there and I was playing saxophone. And I was also like writing songs on the side and getting kind of flirty with that. Like, oh, I kind of like this. And I realized that all the things that I wanted to do in the music industry, I couldn't do in New York City because if I wanted to be a saxophone player, I had to like pick my lane. Not mm. only did I have to pick my lane, it's like I couldn't be an overall saxophone player. I had to be like, well, what era are you from? Are you from right. the 50s? Are you from the mm. 80s? From, are you John Coltrane? Are you? And I'm like, I don't want to be pigeonholed like that. Like, I want to have all this freedom. And so then I, moving to Nashville, it's like, okay, well, use your superpowers and go. And I really do believe in the concept. And so many people talk about this in business and stuff, too. It's like, get really great at one thing because you're mm. competing with other people that are really great at it, too. 
And if you dabble and use, I'm, almost, I'm an energy guy. So it's like, where do you put your energy? And if 20% of your energy is here, 20 is there, 20 there, 20, it's like, you're not going to get to the top of the mountain because somebody's putting 100% of theirs there. Mm. So it's a matter, it's a matter of just remember that who you're competing with are people that are at the top of their game. They want right. that $100,000 too, you know? And it's like, if you're not at the top of your game or working towards the top of your game, right. then, you know, like you said, you're just going to keep running up to, to roadblocks because you just don't have enough energy to give to the thing to get you to the top of your game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that's great. I think that's just, it's so helpful for people that feel very overwhelmed because I think sync is really overwhelming because it's one, it's foreign. So people are like learning about it, maybe on this podcast mm -hmm. that this was even an option. And then they listen and go, and I have to learn a new like genre like that I don't even dabble in. I think there no, can be a lot of stack all. that yeah. can maybe um, just, you know, sort of, Chris, you always say, how do you eat an elephant? And it's sort of one <laughs> bite at a time, I think. Um, that can just be, you know, reassuring people that maybe get uh, a little overwhelmed with the, the process of sync in general. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody, let's say somebody's listening and they want to break into the ads world, like what, what's the like one piece of advice you would give somebody wanting to explore this avenue to increase their revenue as a musician? Uh, I mean, I would start studying ads. And I think the way that you do that is there's a great website called ispot.tv. And you can go there and you can study um, study what's going on, how they're working. And you can, I would even make a list of what, I didn't do this myself, I did in my head kind of, a list of different genres that you're starting to see, um, a list of things that are happening. And the coolest thing about iSpot.tv is that they tell you how many times that particular ad has been played. Mm -hmm. And also they tell you the name of the musician and if they have it, the, the band, the artist. And then what I would do is I'd start Googling those artists. I'd go to their Spotify and I'd start listening to what the song sounds like away from the ad. And um, I would start learning the rules and I would start looking at, well, why do they put the chorus first? That's weird. And they put the chorus first because they want it to be, it's the most interesting thing. And the person, again, if you reverse engineer, they want to hear the chorus first. They don't want to hear a 12 bar intro. So you start to see these patterns and you start to see these things from these songs and start thinking about the different genres that you're connecting to. And then I, and then start going at that umbrella that I'm talking about. And one of the most valuable things that I did that I pushed away for so long, so long, because I was like, I'm not going to do this because I didn't land that ad. What I would do is I would go download MP4s of big ads and I would write my own ad to it. Mm. And that to me is a really valuable tool because what it does is it helps you with pacing. It helps you learn pacing. It helps you learn film cuts. It's like if this pacing works for this particular thing, it's going to work for something else because it's almost mm -hmm. always going to be repeated. Like what do they say? History doesn't repeat itself, but it, it like rhymes. It, it rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's, it's not, thank you. It's, I knew you would know, Patrick. <laughs> it's, I it really you. is not, it's really very consistent. And, you know, it's, that's because what's happening is there's, there's huge ad agencies that handle so many different brands, but you're having the same person that's working with Target, that's working with, you know, McDonald's. So it's like you, they're getting their personal touch. So if you're starting to get their pacing and you're seeing the pacing of how your stuff is, literally, like you said, Chris, too, like it's upbeat or whatever. It's like if you get your pacing to sync with that particular picture, then no doubt it's going to sync with a picture in the future. Yeah, that's so great. That's such great homework, you know, to, to is, prepare yeah. yourself for. So thank you for that. So, oh my gosh. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us today and share some of this. I'm really excited um, because we are actually having a, a live masterclass happening uh, next week called How to Build a Brand New Revenue Stream for Your Music in the Highly Profitable World of Advertising, which Tyler is going to be joining us in leading and I believe you're going to speak to those four C's, right? Those four C's. Yeah. And I definitely am going to kind of genre bust, I guess I would call it, and show people, you know, that the rules really do cross all the genres. So, yeah, I'm excited. I would definitely want to dive into some, some stems specifically. I'm going to talk about like the different, you know, how to write different hooks, how the form of ad ad advertising is built, as well as I'll show you some ads that I've landed and you'll start to see consistency. Like, for example, that Here I Come song, like I'll, I think I have like eight or nine different ads and I'll show you how they're used, be it Tommy Hilfiger, McDonald's, mm -hmm. um, at Angie's List. Like, it's just so interesting how they are used. Like Angie's List, I, the, the ending of the thing goes, da -da 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 
And that's all Angie's List used. It's like, it was like this home repair <laughs> thing. And then all of a sudden, da -da 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 -da. and then the McDonald's one is like almost the whole commercial. It's just somebody walking through with a coffee and this works, you know. So it's interesting to see the use cases and then look at the song itself and realize the structure is, it's, it's, the rules are so specific. And it's just a no brainer when you sit down and if you put yourself in the box. So what I'm going to do is demystify, so to speak, um, what might be overwhelming about writing music for advertising to a place where, yes, there's no specific rules. Anybody can land stuff. But I'm going to give you my concept is I want to make sure that your track gets to the head of the line. And I think that if you follow some of the rules that we're going to go over, you are going to have a success. And literally, the coolest thing about it is you don't need to be overwhelmed because if you're good at what you do, you already have the hardest part. The, the yeah. easiest thing, that. all you got to do is just take your mindset, your concept, and just shift it to these rules and put yourself right. in that box. It's so easy to do that. And yeah, I want to show you those rules so that you can take what you've already built and the skills you've already built and get another side hustle. And I mean, it's it's nice oh, to go man. to the mailbox every quarter and have a song yeah. that took three hours that <laughs> hey. every quarter. Oh, hey, I love that. It feels like a real, like, like it, as you were saying that, it's like you, you're going to decode this, you know, and yeah. it's like, it, it, it's it's almost like math at that point. It's like, you got the talent, great. Let's plug it into this kind of, this framework here and like get, get you off to the races, you know? So, so excited that you're going to be joining us next week. That's going down on the 16th, uh, November 16th at 5 p.m. PT, by the way. And we are going to drop a link for that in this podcast and this youtube description as well man oh man so shall we wrap up there then this has been you know yeah. we, always, we always say like i'm the boots on the ground guy on the team because i'm in the artist artist world so it's always a good litmus test when like tally you were talking i was getting so excited <laughs> like, oh good really good, good. you're gonna talk about all that stuff i mean it's just uh yeah any chris we speak about this idea of like hey if you're really good at the thing you do then like let us help you monetize it and this is sort of another faction of that idea so i can't wait for the 16th hope everyone checks it out uh like we say links in the description and we'll we'll leave it there and we'll see all you guys in like a week from now all right thanks, thanks guys so much guys peace like a like a like a boss like a like a boss do it like a like a